Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everyone. Thanks, as always, for joining us for another edition of The Avid Reader, brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop. Our guest today is Bill Shutt, author of Pump, A Natural History of the Heart. Actually, it goes pump, 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 just like I am right now, and hopeful, hopefully for the remainder of this interview. Um, it's published by Algonquin, which is a division of Workman, and it was released in late September. It's garnered praise from Publishers Weekly, Kirkus, Wall Street Journal. His previous book, Cannibalism, Another Natural History, Who Doesn't Like Cannibalism? And prior to that, Dark Banquet, which is blood and the curious lives of blood feeding creatures and who doesn't love blood sucking creatures um which was also a bestseller and uh, chosen uh, as best book of 2008 by i can't remember who and he's also co-authored three novels hell's gate the himalayan uh, codex and the darwin strain he's working on his first solo novel now and a non-fiction book about teeth and who doesn't love teeth generally um so as I began to write this introduction, I thought of silly puns in order to make clear the nature in which we imbue our hearts with qualities they simply don't have. Um, so, you know, like, let's get to the heart of the matter. My heartfelt thanks to Bill. It takes a, a lot of heart to write a book like this. I hope I have the heart to conduct this interview. And then I thought I might bring in playing cards or courage, or Valentine's, you know, that's just me. Afraid, I was afraid of losing heart. And then I realized that one, Bill has already heard these and that he's actually referred to most in his uh, prefatory definition of the heart. So then I felt bad also that I hadn't included the marvelous illustrations in this book in some kind of PowerPoint presentation and, or share screen or something. But you can see those done quite well and uh, in an elegant and complimentary uh, fashion to the book. Um, but then I thought, you know, well, since Bill has talked about this topic so much that perhaps I could make up for the loss of the illustrations by having a more wide ranging conversation dealing with matters that, yes, concern the anatomical structure of the heart. And yes, it's natural history, but touching upon some of the other aspects of this work, including its great sense of humor, its instruction to not look at the heart in isolation, but in conjunction with those other integral structures and processes in our body, which mesh with the heart and not only assist in its work, but are vital as a bulwark to the heart's existence at all. So welcome, Bill, and thanks so much for joining us today. Oh, what a great intro. I, I'm, I'm just going to sit back and let you talk. <laughs> thanks for having me. Yeah, that's what I usually do anyway. Yeah, you're going to have to shut me up. Um, <laughs> okay, so here's, it's easy for me. <clears throat> Let's ask well, you know, I was going to ask the first question would be, what is the heart? But you know what I ought to ask? Because you do it so well in the other interviews is, what brought you to this place where you, as well as I, love cannibalism and love blood sucking? And it, it, it was a long journey and you describe it so well. Why don't you just give us a thumbnail sketch of that first? Yeah, I, I, I was... I've always been into the macabre. I mean, Alfred Hitchcock is probably is certainly my favorite director, and and I've always been into horror films and and things like that. And so um, when I when, when I went for my PhD, I studied vampire bats. So so nobody's really surprised that my first book was about vampirism in the animal kingdom, and and the second one was about cannibalism. But but when I I started to think about what as a, something as a follow up to cannibalism, I had this big list of all this kind of like nasty stuff. And and my editor and my and, and my agent, uh, Jillian McKenzie, sort of subtly suggested that I look for something maybe a bit more mainstream. And and the list that they gave me had hearts in it. And and so, uh, you know, my knee jerk reaction to, to that was. Uh, that's got to have been done. There's so many books about hearts and there's so many experts about this. I'm not an expert about hearts. You know, what is there to do? So they said, uh, you know, check it out. So when I when I did the initial research, I was really surprised to find that there was no book out there that that was written the way I would have, 
you know, the, the type of book I like to write where I move through the animal kingdom first. It's certainly not an encyclopedia, not a textbook. De-emphasize the jargon. Try to make it entertaining. Try to make it humorous where, you know, where appropriate. Um, and, and so I, when I did that, the examples in the animal kingdom that I found were tied in. Many of them were tied in so closely to to modern research on 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 human hearts and and cardiac medicine that that was just that was it right then. And and when I look back at 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 the history of uh, of of what we thought about the heart from the ancient Egyptians through the Greeks and the Romans and and through the Middle Ages and even into fairly modern times, how wrong we got things. And then it was a no brainer that that this was a book that that I could really, you know, sink my teeth into. You know, as a, um, you know, you talk about jokes and it's funny because as a bookseller, I've, I've begun to realize over the years how humor moves the reader so much more quickly and excessively. And with your students too, I'm sure. They, they want to learn more and the humor kind of pulls them along, which is great and you do it so well. Oh, but, thanks. And the other thing is, can you hold up your book? <laughs> oh, let's see. Yeah. Uh. Because, and I say this in every single interview, people say you can't judge a book by its cover, but every single customer who comes in my store does that. And it's a, <laughs> it's a great cover because it gives you that kind of rhythmic sense of what yeah. we're going through. Yeah, I, I, I really I really like it. And, and you mentioned the illustrations. I, I've been really lucky for, for the past 30 years I've been working with a with with a very very good friend of mine Patricia J Wynn and she's an award winning illustrator has worked on 250 books and and we've been we've been office mates at, at the Museum of Natural History for and and good friends for a long time and she has illustrated every scientific paper that I ever wrote uh, any book chapters that I ever took part in and then all three of my nonfictions and and all three of my novels um, so I've been really lucky, and and the relationship we have there is is one that is that I don't think a lot of authors have if they if if they need illustrators. You know, you know, this is sort of um, a much closer relationship, and she knows what I want now. Uh, not to say that we don't, you know, we don't have to work it out to figure out exactly what I'm looking for, but but um, you know, having worked with her so long, it's almost like she can read my mind at times. And it's funny how the illustrations seem to import more knowledge than a photograph would. And, yeah. and the other thing is, I really enjoyed the one YouTube where she also talks. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, that was really good too. And yeah, the illustrations are great. And like I said, yeah, missing them. But there are other ways that people can watch them with the illustrations done really well. So I thought, okay, why don't I just ask you about puffer fishes, fugos? And, you know, we can start with that. What the hell, you know? Yeah. That, that I mean that was sort of a tangential topic that that I, that I put in there and and the, I'm uh, I'm I really enjoy doing that is so you know you think you're going in one direction and then suddenly I go I, I go off into something else and and that is um that that is this whole idea of that we have the blood this so the book is not just about the heart it's about the circulatory system right and we have this thing called the blood brain barrier and that prevents um uh, that that prevents a lot of bad stuff from getting into the nervous system. There's no such thing as sort of a, you know, a mild um, infection of your brain or, or it, 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 that's, if it gets in there, it's, it's problematic. And so we have this mechanism and it, and it has, it, you know, it's, it's multi-staged how this works, um, but it prevents for example, large molecules from getting in and getting out or, 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 or bacteria from getting into uh, the nervous system. So, so tetrodotoxin is this substance that's produced by, um, we, we believe by, by, by some type of bacteria um, that, that, that fish ingest and, and, and puffer fish being one of them. But the reason that I got into it was because uh, it's also transmitted rarely, but it is transmitted through the eggs of horseshoe crabs, which in, it, not, not in the United States, but in other places it's eaten. And so this substance, we, we're not quite sure how it passes into the blood brain barrier, but what we are certain of is, is that, that, it, that if you do happen to, to contract this, um, the, the, this poisoning, uh, that, that you're in real trouble. And, and it starts, 
it starts with sort of a numbness in your mouth, which is the reason why you're eating this fugu, the puffer fish anyway, because you're sort of catching a buzz from it. Um, but if you, but if, you, but, but if you're not lucky and, and this stuff gets, gets past your blood brain barrier, then, then it basically takes apart your, your, your central nervous system while you're awake. Um, so you really sort of understand what's taking place here as it paralyzes your muscles, including muscles like the diaphragm and the muscles that allow you to breathe. Um, it, you know, so, so I, I thought that this would be sort of an interesting place to, to put that information in there. And um, mainly because of the blood brain barrier, that was the example I gave about how that works and, and how it doesn't. And then every once in a while you stick in a, a humorous aside, <laughs> which is great. But the thing is, and then I went down the rabbit hole when I was researching it, because then I figured out, I mean, these guys, the chefs have to have two years of instruction and they have to get a certificate and a license. And uh, it was fascinating that, you know, it's just, it's just funny. And then of course you said horseshoe crabs and you devote a whole bunch of this book to horseshoe crabs. And it's like, you say they've been around for half a billion years. And I, I think they go around thinking, you know, this is cool, we're fine, like cockroaches. We don't need to do anything, you know, evolution has pretty much put us in a spot where, you know, we can survive five extinctions and we'll probably be here after a nuclear holocaust. Yeah, until relatively recently, I guess that was true. You know, right. and, and I, 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 the, you know, the, the term living fossil is, is, is to me thrown around a lot. And, and, and this is the case where this is a living fossil. If you looked at fossils of, of horseshoe crabs, from half a billion years ago, they look exactly like horseshoe crabs today. And that's 250 million years before the first dinosaur. So these are, they've been around a while and they've gone through all of these extinctions. Uh, but, you know, in the 19th century, uh, folks in, in, in the United States along the East Coast found out that they, could, that, that they could get massive numbers of these things as they come from deep water into the shallows in the spring and, and, and early summer uh, to mate. And, and you can collect you know, you, you, you see these pictures from the early 20th century, late 19th century of, of vast walls built on of, of horseshoe crabs that were just used, that were used for fertilizer. And millions and millions of them were taken every year. You know, a million of them from like a mile of beach in New Jersey, which to me is insane. So, so eventually they figured out that there were better types of fertilizer that could be used, but then um, fishermen, realized that that this was a great bait if you chopped them off, especially the big ones, the females that had eggs, um, and, and you would throw them in your traps for for catching eels or 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 or, um, or, or whelk. And um and so that became an issue. But it really turned so so they so they, they became endangered because of of that and because of the fertilizer uh, use as well. But in the 1960s a researcher figured out that there's a substance in their blood which is blue for reasons that I get into in, in, mm -hmm. in pump, there's a substance in there that when it comes into contact with the endotoxin, it, it gives a visible response, it forms a clot. And, and, and just briefly, endotoxin is something that is, that is released by certain types of bacteria, called gram-negative bacteria. And, and in many instances, the substance is not, is, is not released on purpose by the bacteria, but it's released when you destroy that bacteria by sterilizing, um, let's say a hospital room or, 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 or catheters that you're gonna sell or, or a batch of drugs. And if this substance gets into, your, um, your, into a human circulatory system, it can kill you. So, so thousands of lives have been saved by the fact that, 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 they, that they, they, they figured out that you know, the, the, these industries built up, small industries, but industries nonetheless, that, that would collect horseshoe crabs, once again, right before they mate, uh, because that's when they're available, hang them upside down uh, in an industrial setting and then drain their blood. Um, and, and then, you know, the, these animals are sort of carried in, no water, no, no temperature control. And then by law, they need to be returned to where you collected them from. Meanwhile, they've lost 40% of their blood. Uh, they've been out of the water for 72 hours and many of them die. Now, now that's not to say that this is not an important um, uh, uh, medical benefit because it is. Uh, and, and but it's still causing real problems for these populations. Now, the good news was that about probably about six, seven years ago, the, a, a, uh, using DNA technology, a, a, a test was developed that could, that, that could alert 
into the presence of endotoxin without using horseshoe crab blood. The, the problem was that when COVID hit, the availability of that test was not as great as the other tests were. Um, and, and you know, in, in all of these different companies that had been set up collecting horseshoe crabs. So that got kind of kicked to the back burner. And, and, um, and, and now massive numbers of these uh, animals are, are, still being, are still being used. So we hope that when, once we get, a, get COVID under control, that, that, that other companies will pop up that use this um, that non-horseshoe crab uh, technology. Uh, and by the same token, folks at Cornell have come up with a synthetic horseshoe crab scent that they've been giving out to uh, to, to eel fishermen and to and to whelk fishermen. So and so in theory, you could take a uh, you could take a roll of toilet paper and put this scent on it. And uh, <laughs> um, I was on um, uh, this week in science, and 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 Blair, one of the one of the co-hosts, suggested that they call it. I, I can't believe it's not horseshoe crab. So. So I, I may try to contact the company and, and give them that suggestion, but um, but we're we're hopeful, but but still they're being used in massive numbers and they are now endangered because of that. And I haven't even spoken about the ones in uh, in, in in Asia, and that all of them are endangered because they're being eaten, especially their eggs, which is why I did the little snarky take on you know this is what happens if you eat these and things go go south. Um, so yeah, just a, a an, another. Uh, interesting example that that I ran into that I just you know I, I started looking at the horseshoe crabs thinking I was going to tell the story of their hearts which are very different than a than say a vertebrate heart because the stimulus for them to contract comes from nerves on the outside of the heart whereas we've got this pacemaker you know so I was all set to do this take about you know this is why you don't see Aztec priests uh, you know yanking out the heart of a horseshoe crab on, on, on top of a, a pyramid and holding it out to the crowd below, because as soon as you pulled it out, it would stop beating. But, but that sort of went by the wayside as I ran into this story of, um, of, of their blood. You know, it was also funny the way you asked this guy, you know, what are the alternatives? And he basically said, uh, good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it wasn't that you were naive, you were suggesting something that was plausible and easy to do. And he was saying, they're not gonna listen to you. No. It was depressing, but true. But you know, the other thing, you know, going back to your uh, interest, I was, I was like you, Jacques Cousteau and Wild Kingdom. Oh and yeah. Mar Marlon Perkins and Jim. <laughs> and I always liked the fact that his name was Marlon, which reminded me that my veterinarian was named Dr. Fox and my first wife's gynecologist was named Dr. Menzies. And I was thinking, I wonder if, you know, <laughs> I wonder if your name kind of like, <laughs> all right, this is what I do. See, like I said, I go <laughs> off, you got to stop me. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, no. Go well, so, for it. <laughs> well, let's go back to, the, to one of the, the big stories that you go talk about. And it really is kind of a gnomon of the entire book. And you kind of start out with it is the blue whale story and the plastination. What was the name of that exhibit that that guy did before, you know? You know and yeah, that was the, the bodies exhibit. And th right. there are a number of, you know, it's taken a couple of forms since then, but that's where I saw it on the, on, you know, at South Street Seaport when it first opened. I hold my anatomy students there from Long Island University and it freaked everybody out. You know, here's this, yeah. you see this guy dribbling a basketball and but he has no skin and he's now made out of plastic. Other than that, it looks completely normal. Yeah, and I was like cancel culture too, because some people were so against it, think it was, you know, like sacrilege in a way, like, yeah. like many of the things you think about. But, but the other, but go ahead and tell the story about it sinking in the cold water and all that. Yeah, so, so, so my, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm a research associate at the American Museum of Natural History, but I have friends that at, at other museums, and, and one of them where I've got a bunch of friends is the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto. And, um, and, and several uh, folks there are, 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 are whale experts. And, and they'd always gotten the question, some of the curators had been, had been getting this question, you know, what's the largest heart in the world? Blue whale heart, uh, how big is it? Uh, size of a sedan. But, but, but they really didn't know because these, because we don't know a lot about their internal anatomy. And the reason is because when they die, they sink. So these were not the right whales back in the whaling days. They were the ones that, you know, when you threw a harpoon in them, they floated. Um, then you could drag them onto your ship. But blue whales were fast and they sank when you, when you killed them. So, so they were no good. Um, in, in 2014, nine of them died. And they, and they, walked, they, they were trapped on the ice up in Newfoundland and, and, and three of them didn't sink. 
And we think that they were propped up on the ice flow. And so, uh, so, so, so my, my friend Mark at, 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 the, at the ROM decided, well, this is a neat opportunity. We may be able to go salvage one of these things and, and see what they look like in, internally. So two of them washed up on these, in these small, in these small villages that, that had never seen anything like this before. All of a sudden it's like, you know, you know, floating in there right next to the only restaurant in town is 90 tons of, of now bloated, stinking creature. So, so my friends went up there and, and we're talking about uh, heavy, heavy equipment, uh, prying apart the ribs and four guys inside this thing, pushing, severing the heart and then pushing it out the open. And when they got it out, and when I looked at the pictures, it didn't really look like a mammalian heart. I described it. When I first saw it, it looked to me like a 400 pound soup dumpling. The whole thing just collapsed like a blob. And so they didn't realize that that, that it was going to look like that. So this was a mammal heart. Why didn't it look like a typical mammalian heart? So that was only one of the questions that, that they had. The other thing is that it was a lot smaller than they thought it was going to be. You know, here's a creature that was 90, uh, that, that, that weighed 90 tons, and, and its heart was r relatively small. So, so the, the, the example I use is if they'd have a 90 ton hummingbird laying alongside this whale corpse, its heart would have been eight times the size. It would have been 3,200 pounds. And, and the reason for that, what they believe is that if you're a hummingbird and, and your heart is beating, excuse me, and your wings are beating at, at 80 times per second, then you've got to supply those muscles with, with blood, um, of oxygen, nutrients. You got to take away waste and carbon dioxide. So one way to do that is they have a ridiculously high heart rate. And we're talking like 1,260 beats per minute, which is like 10 times faster than what our heart beats at. Okay. So that we think is about the limit that a, that a heart can beat. If you look at the heart as a sort of a little machine, it has to fill up and then empty that 1260 times a minute. That's probably about it. The only other way to get more blood to those muscles is to have a larger heart. In this case, a much larger heart. So the little guys that are that have high me metabolic rates, like shrews, little mousy looking thing, and hummingbirds have much, much larger hearts than a, than, a, um, than, a, than a blue whale whose heart is maybe beating 12, 15 times per minute. And then when it's diving, maybe two or three times per minute. And that's the key, they think, to the fact that this thing looked like a big soup dumpling, just because when it does these deep dives, the heart just collapses. Rather than have to withstand that tremendous pressure uh, as you dive deeply, it just like flattens out and beats maybe a couple of times a minute. But there are all sorts of cool things that they're trying to figure out from this heart. There were blood vessels there that they didn't know. They still don't know what they are. And they've got another big whale heart that they're now preserving of a related species that they can sort of compare and contrast, which is always, you know, when you're studying anatomy, and I did this with when I studied vampire bats, is it's always kind of cool to look at, at, at similar creatures and see how they are anatomically different than, than, than the one that you happen to be looking at. And then you can relate that to things like their behavior, their evolution, why, why, why this anatomical difference. So they're all excited now because they've got another big whale heart uh, that they can make these comparisons to. Yeah, that's a great opportunity. When they were inside the whale, it, all, it reminded me of a scene from Men in Black. Like when, when you, the guy goes inside the monster and comes back out. But I think it was also in one of the Avengers movies, but I could just see them inside of there. Um, anyway, um, there I go again. Uh, the other question I was going to ask you was, um, and, and I'll switch around too, like I always do. It's interesting when you talk about the Egyptians and then the Greeks kind of like picking up on it and then Galen. And I wonder, well, you can talk about that, but I also wonder why the church decided that Galen's theories were essentially divinely inspired. Where yeah. Uh, th that, you know, it's funny because I've written three nonfiction books and Galen pops up in all of them. Uh, and, and, and a lot of that has to do with this idea of the four humors and which was this idea that he had, he had, he had picked that up from the, from, from the Greeks and the Greeks probably gleaned that one from the ancient Egyptians. Um, and so, so basically this is something that, um, you know, as, as far as Galen goes, this is a guy who who, who was a, a surgeon and a physician, but he was not allowed to deal with, um, with, with, with human bodies. So he got a lot wrong. And what he got wrong 
was was well documented and 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 he wrote three million words we think it was between him and his followers and and when 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 rome fell his work was not initially translated into latin uh, which was at the time in the west it was you know that was the that that was the the language of scholarship and it sat and when it was translated in the early middle ages it was translated by syrian christians that were and these scholars when they translated Galen's work into, uh, in, when they translated his work, they translated it into Arabic. And from Arabic in the West, it was translated into Latin finally. And when it was translated, we believe it re sort of reflected the, 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 the beliefs of the translators. Now Galen, we, we think was a monotheist. We don't think he was a Christian, but we think he was a monotheist. The Syrian Christians picked up on that, gave their translation a Christian slant. And when it finally got translated into Latin in the West, the church loved it. And so that's why it was, it was declared to be, his word was declared to be divinely inspired. And you could not at that point do any type of research, question anything that was in Galen. And, and he got a tremendous amount wrong. You know, the whole idea of two separate circulatory systems with blood coming from different places, different organs. The idea of, you know, on, on one side, the, the, there's air in the arterial side. Well, and, and the idea of these four humors, anything that you want to talk about with regard to health, be it mental or physical health, you've got to balance these four substances in the body. Um, you know, blood being one of them. And this led to people being bled for 1500 years. And so, 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 so really in the West, medicine, uh, innovation in, in the field of medicine came to a standstill because of this sort of lockstep adherence to the word, the badly translated word of a, of a, of a, of a Roman who had got a lot wrong to begin with. Um, and this, I mean, this carried on in the West until the 17th century. So that really put the, uh, you know, put the brakes on most, you know, most innovation in the field of medicine. All these ideas come into my head and I'm too old to remember all of them. Uh, wait, okay, one was, when I read that book, How We Die by Sherwin Newland, you know, mm -hmm. um, he said, we all die because our heart stops beating. And I thought about that when you were talking about, hey, don't read this book like it's, like you tell your students, you know, it's not the chapter about the heart, you're done with that. That, that you can't do it that way, that it's like the book, the book gills, um, these pages are all integral. You explain it, I'm just talking. You explain yeah, well, first of all, I, I, when, it must've been, I don't know, 20, 25 years ago when, when Newland's book came out, How We Die and How We Get Sick, I, I was really, um, they had a huge uh, effect on me. And I thought he was such a great writer and, and was right. able to get information across in a jargon-free manner. And really, this is the first time I've thought about that in a while. I mean, he really, I, I think when I think back now about what inspired me to write the way I do, which is you know, to try to take complex topics and, and turn them into something that, you know, stories that you would repeat at the dinner table, but not, you know, not because they're, you know, uh, you know, not because they're gross or you want to gross somebody out, but because they're 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 odd and they're they're intriguing in a way, and 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 so that's you know I really followed that path, and I, and I think now that now that you mention it, I think that Newland was was somebody who um, who who also did that. Okay, so now I've forgotten your first your, your question. <laughs> what did I? Oh well, wait. Before that though, I like the beginning of that novel. Not shit, I call it a novel because it's like your yeah, yeah. book is a novel. But it was like you know he was a resident and he goes in there and he thinks he screwed up and anyway, yeah. I got to go back and read that again. You know something I really do uh, because it was I thought it was that good of a book. I thought both of them were terrific. I know because you just you couldn't not be excited. It was very difficult not to be excited by yeah, it. And I, I agree. Understand what you were was, saying. He was so enthusiastic about what he did. And you know, I, 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 if, if I'm one thing, it's enthusiastic about the things that, I, that I've been privileged to be able to study and teach. I mean, I get to travel around and study bats for God's sake. Well, it's um, like, you know, you're like an Oliver Sacks. It's another situation just exactly the same way. You know, like the man who mistook his wife for a hat. You know, it's yeah. the same kind of approach that the reader, and again, as a, a bookseller, the reason why this is on the front table is because 
you know, you can hand sell it very easily. Yeah. And, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's helpful when you, when you're a teacher, it, it just, it keeps, nowadays it keeps students from like looking at their, at their cell phone back when I was going to school, it's like, you know, you're, you're checking your watch. When is this guy going to be get done yammering? So or you have a copy of one book in front, you know, you have a, a copy of one book inside the book that you're supposed to be oh, reading. Oh yeah, that's it. Yeah, we all did that. All right. Or either that or I would be drawing cartoons, you know, and, I, yeah, and my too. textbooks are all full of like, you know, guys, ch monsters chasing people. And, um, but, but yeah, I, I, when I became a teacher, I didn't want to do that. And, you know, I think maybe that came out of the fact that I, I did, you know, I did a, a, a bit of, of, of stage work when I was younger and, um, <laughs> And it's it's all about grabbing an audience and 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 entertaining them and and when you do that then you can get your points across and so when yeah. I be, when I started writing it was really the same thing you know if I'm right. ever and on and on and on showing off my my you know how much jargon I know that then it's going to be a snooze fest but if I can uh, take apart a, a a complex term or a complex topic which which I'm doing right now in this book on teeth I was doing that this morning uh, trying to explain some uh, some 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 specifics um, that, that then I think that your readers are are more appreciative of it. At, at least mine have been, and and so that's what I try to do. I'm not I'm not I'm not showing off. I'm there to bring everybody along. I don't want anybody. You know, my my worst reviews are, are in my mind when I read a comment um, that says something about you know I was confused about this or you know he was uh, he was speaking above what, what my knowledge level. That 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 to me is. Uh, that I don't, that I really uh, I don't like. <laughs> yeah, the worst on my YouTube comments is, "What gave the interviewer the right to spend nine tenths of the time talking himself?" <laughs> <laughs> but I re I remember the question. Yeah, that, wait, I did that one. <laughs> Sorry, I remember the question. It was the book. It was the 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 book gills. It was the idea that you can't take the heart by itself. It's, yeah, it's not fair to the rest of the body. Yeah, I knew that. I knew it tied into the to teaching somehow because that you know I'd always told my students that, if, and I taught anatomy and physiology for mostly for pre-professional students uh, for for about two decades, and I would always tell them that, uh, and you're used to taking classes where you come in, you learn this material, you take an exam or a quiz, and then you forget it by the time you go out to your car, and and that's not the way to look at that at. At anatomy uh, and, and, and the human body, or or any any anatomical system, because they're completely tied into other systems. So so you can't think of these like a book chapter. Where all right, I'm done with circulatory system. Now I'm going to move on to you know the nervous system, and 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 there's no connection there. That's that, that's completely the wrong way because they're so intimately involved that you can't, for example, you can't understand how how the circulatory system works without with it without understanding the respiratory system and you can't understand how either of those work without without the nervous system that that really controls a lot of what goes on that brings me to something else i just thought of before it goes out of my head was in my goofy introduction when i'm talking about all these cliches you talk uh, in one of your chapters in the second maybe the second part you talk about this okay why do we do that why is something heartfelt? Why do you feel like your heart's coming, going to jump out of your throat? Why do I feel like I don't have the heart to do something? Who, who decided that's going to be the organ we use? Yeah, that, I mean, once again, so, so when I wrote a book about cannibalism, the, and, and, I, and I asked the question, why do you have this knee-jerk reaction to that very word? Why, why does everybody sort of react the same way when I say cannibal? Um, and, and that chapter was going to be called blame it on the Greeks. And, and so that, that, that eventually changed. But, um, but when I started to think about where this whole idea of the heart and its tie into emotion and, and, and intellect and memory and the soul, where did that come from? I, I could have named that chapter, blame it on the ancient Egyptians, because at, at least in the West, because that's, they held the brain, uh, they held the brain to be in, uh, basically useless. They pull it out of your head with a uh, you know, out through your nose with a hook when they were mummifying you. But the heart, they treated with reverence, and they 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 preserved it separately. They kept it in a in a in a jar uh, to be re you know put back into the in, into the mummy. And so the, so they thought that no, oh, here's this thing. It moves. It's sort of centrally located. It responds to stimuli. If you scare someone, their their heart beats faster. That sort of thing. 
Um, and, and so th that's where this idea that the heart is central to all of the things that, you know, many of them we now attribute to the brain and, and, the, and the nervous system, but that's where a lot of that stuff came from was the ancient Egyptians. And, and so the, the, the Greeks, who, you know, Egyptian medical information was, was held in high esteem by, by the Greeks who, who often went to Egypt, to Alexandria and places like that to study. Um, and, and so when, 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 so they picked up on this whole idea of cardiocentrism, right? In their medical studies, in their writings, and then the artists jumped in, whether it was poets or, or, or storytellers or, 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 or painters. And, and so they said, oh, the heart is the center of all of these things. And that's where these terms came from. And that's where this idea that was passed on to the Romans and from the Romans to, you know, I could go on and on in the West about all of these artists who then songwriters, who then picked up this idea that the, that the heart is, is the place where you want to look if you're, if you're talking about emotion, especially strong emotions like love and hate and, uh, and, and that sort of thing. And, and I'm really, have, I have absolutely no problem with that when you consider the alternatives, especially when you deal with things like song titles. But, um, you know, it's the problems that, it's the, the problems that the medical community faced when, when they had to sort of fall in lockstep with this belief that, that the heart was really the place where, um, if you wanted answers to where, where, where the, you know, you know, the, where the, the mind and, and memory and, and, and intellect and the soul, you know, that at that point they get that wrong. Um, but I never but, figured out, I never figured out how they pulled out the entire brain with that hook through the novel. <laughs> yeah, no films of that, unfortunately. It's, it's, it's funny because as you go through this, and you divide. Oh, you know what? As far as humor and uh, insight, and again, as a bookseller, talk about your two epigraphs. I just, I, especially since it's from Strunk and White. How the hell did they get in Strunk and White? I don't oh, know. Which one? That. Oh, in the front. Yeah. Let's see. Oh, just oh, there's a whole bunch of good ones. Yeah, hearts cannot be broken. They're soft. They're, excuse me. Hearts cannot be broken. They're small, squishy things. But Jeff Haskell is. Um, is a, a, a friend of mine and and um, back in the days when he was the lead singer and and uh, in the Judy Bats which were an alternative band that that I was really into when I was uh, uh, when I was in graduate school and uh, I went and saw them when I was a PhD student at Cornell and then years later um, met him online and and went down to Knoxville and hung out with him in this really we had a memorable evening of of just going out and 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 laughing and hanging out with his friends in in, in Knoxville so so I've always thought he was a great lyricist. And, 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 and when I wrote this book, I knew that I wanted to put that line in there. So he, he, appre he appreciates that fact. He's a very funny uh, guy. And then, okay, I'm rem and the second one is, I'm reminded of the advice of my neighbor, quote, never worry about your heart <laughs> until it stops beating. Um, strunk and white elements of style. Yeah, I just, you know, when, when I, when I write these books, when I write nonfiction and when I write novels, I'm always looking for quotes and, you know, to, to, to put it at the, at the front of chapters or at the front of the book. And this one just seemed appropriate. So that's why it wound up there. You know, I, I really don't, I, I never met Mr. Strunk and Mr. White. So um, I, I don't have a cool story about going, hanging out and drinking with them. Well, the funny thing, uh, again, you know, not to go on and on, but when you, when someone comes in and looks at the cover, they're intrigued, they open the book, they go to the epigraphs because it's like a jigsaw puzzle. It's like, you're looking at the box, which tells you about all the little pieces inside. And so the epigraph, generally the author spends a lot of time thinking about it because as I said, it's, it's kind of like, okay, here's what you're going to find inside. And um, so, yeah, those were two really, they both drew you in and they both, again, carried all that sense of humor. Yeah, I think, Jeff, I mean, you know, nobody read Jeff's quote and thought, oh, this is going to be a textbook. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't, one of the most important parts of your book and instruct, instructive and also saying, hey, let's move on this is the third part. We talks about basically regenerative medicine and the idea of the recipient of a heart essentially being the donor of the heart as well maybe we could go into that a little bit sure um you know that 
so, so as I said, there, there, there was this list of, of animals that I went through that, that, that had interesting aspects to their circulatory systems. But, but I found it even more interesting that they, that, that they were being used by, by modern researchers to further our knowledge about cardiac medicine. But then I got to how I wanted to tie this up in, in, the, in the, last, the, the last section of this book. Um, I was lucky enough to meet uh, Dr. Harold Ott in, uh, at, at Harvard and, and his research, he's one of many people trying to solve this problem of not enough donor organs. So thousands of people die every year waiting for a donor organ. And, and one of the key reasons there is not only because there's not enough organs, but you, you need to be able to match these organs the, from the donor to the recipient. And we're talking about tissue type, we're talking about blood type. Um, and, and so one of the ways that, that I found out from, from, from Dr. Ott that, that they're trying to cope with this is that they're starting out with, he's starting out with a, with a cadaver heart. And, and so this would be, in the future, this, this, this would be taking place. If you were gonna say donate your, people donate their, their, their body to science, here you would donate your, your heart to, this, to, a, to different facilities. And what they would do is what Dr. Ott is now trying out, mostly with animal hearts for the most part. So he takes this heart from a donor and if he were to take that heart and, and transplant it into, into any recipient, in all likelihood, their recipient's immune system would, would mount a, re, a response and that, and that organ would be rejected. Heart, kidney, liver, whatever you want to transplant. But what he's doing is he's taking this heart and putting it through a, 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 a system where they drip a, a detergent through it. And that detergent dissolves away all of the cells that your body would have an immune reaction to. So if you're looking at the heart, you're, it's mostly things like cardiac muscle cells. So you can see this taking place over a, a, over a period of time as this organ turns from this, you know, um, red meaty looking structure into something that is ghostly white. And it keeps the same shape. That's because of the connective tissue, a lot of collagen. The key here is that it keeps the same shape and your body does not have this immune response or a very great immune response to collagen. So now what he's thinking, he's got this model of a heart. Now what he wants to do, and he sees this happening within 10 years, is here's somebody who's gonna be a, a heart transplant recipient or a kidney transplant recipient. And um, he takes a, a sample, a cell sample from their skin. And this would be a cell called a fibroblast. And so he's not doing these deep biopsies where he's got to go in, pull something out that's uh, you know traumatic. He's taking a fibroblast, a skin cell, and through modern technology, and this exists, converting that into a stem cell. And we know that stem cells can be stimulated, depending on how they're stimulated by the body, can become any type of cell. We also know how to take a stem cell and stimulate it to become a cardiac muscle cell. And that's what he's doing. So he's culturing these cells, now, remember, that's the cells. Those are the cells taken from the recipient. And now what he wants to do, once he has this tissue culture, is literally seed that model that was left of connective tissue with the cells from the recipient and grow a heart to order for that person. So I was blown away by this. And he said, you know, you know within 10 years. Yeah, well, that's, that's what I was going to say, you know. Everybody gives a timeline of things, whether it's building a rocket or becoming carbon neutral. So in your, I was gonna, in your heart of hearts, um, do you, what do you really think? Do you, not 10 years, it's, well, do you think it'll be 10 years? I mean, it may be sooner, you know, I, because I, I jumped all over it. I was like, well, what about the blood vessels? So he said, well, I'm going to send you to somebody and you can talk to, to them. So I went to Worcester Poly. He sent me up to his friend, Glenn Goddard at, at Worcester Polytech. And, and what this guy is doing is it's, it's very difficult for, uh, it's, it's difficult to, 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 to transplant veins because they're very thin, especially small ones. Artery, not so much because they got a muscular wall. So they're easier to knit together, but veins, not so much. Um, what he's doing is he, he comes out, he's got a, 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 a plate and there's like salad in it. And he says, what do you see? And I go, uh, you know, spinach and stuff. He goes, yeah. Look at the spinach leaf. What do you see in the spinach leaf? 
So I look at it and I go, I don't know, uh, uh, chlorophyll, uh, you know, green color, uh, veins to supply. He goes, yeah, veins. So what they're doing is they're doing the same type of drip with the, uh, with the detergent that washes away all of the cellular components, leaves the cellulose structure behind, the equivalent of the connective tissue in the heart. And here is this tube that is now made of cellulose, completely hollow. It's there to transplant. Uh, tra it's there to transport water and, and nutrients in the leaf, you know, from the leaf down. Um, and he's now seeding these vessels made of cellulose with vascular tissue to grow a vein that already has structure that he can then transplant into places like the coronary vessels of, of this heart that Dr. Uh, Ott is, is, is putting together. So, so I really think that because of the, of the lack of, of, because we don't have enough hearts, that this, that this type of research and other research like it will definitely be, uh, be used within the next decade. Uh, I would say it's, it's a real good bet from what I saw. And they're not just talking about hearts. You know, it's funny watching you and listening to the other ones. You're so consistently enthusiastic about what you're talking about. And it must be so much fun traveling around and talking to these different people. What do you, what's going on in your head that makes you so happy, so happy to do this stuff? Why do you think I, that is? I, I, I don't know. I think I've, I've been a zoologist since I was a little kid. I, like, like you mentioned, I was big time into, into Jacques Cousteau. Back then, you know, there weren't that many of those no. shows on TV. Um, and, and so Wild Kingdom was the other one um, uh, that, uh, that I have to laugh because there was always a story that turned into something about the, uh, about an about the, the real estate company. <laughs> no, uh, about the insurance. <laughs> Bone hole, yeah. yeah. I Bone felt sorry hole. for, I felt sorry for Jim. And he was like, you know, he was always laid off on Jim to explain everything. Now these monkeys are surviving and so will you and your family with mutual of Omaha insurance. And then it would cut to commercial and I'd look at my mother like, what? Um, but I don't know. I, I just, I just feel that I'm, that I've always been intrigued by, by nature and, and especially the, the kind of like oddball type of things. And, um, and so I'm very, very lucky. I mean, who gets, who gets to be a research associate at, at the American Museum of Natural History. And so I've never really um, gotten over or gotten used to, to, to being able to do those, to do those sort of things. Vampire bats, come on. That's right. You That's know. what I said at the beginning. Who, who doesn't like them? It's yeah, like my I mean, people, people who, who haven't seen me for 20, 30 years, and then they connect with me on, the, on, uh, you know, on social media. And they're like, so what do you do for a living? Oh, I study vampire bats. And they're like, yeah, that sounds about right for you. Yeah, sure. Right. Yeah, it's like, you know, I watched this documentary about booksellers and they said, what would you do if you weren't a bookseller? And he goes, I don't know. There isn't anything else to do, really. <laughs> there you go. That's the same idea. And the other thing is my dad always said was, if you wake up in the morning and you want to go to work, you got a pretty good life. Yeah, that, that yes. And I've gone through that for, you know, I retired. Uh, I took an early retirement a year ago and I'm now I just write full time and um, but, but I really never, I, I always got up in the morning looking forward to doing what I was doing, especially teaching. I love to be in front of, um, of, of my, of my classes, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, so, no, you, you must, fun. you must get great evaluations. Well, I don't know. Is well, that, the, the, the topics that I got to work on were fun. You know, I worked at Southampton college where it was all marine science and I was the non-marine science guy. So I was like, I want to teach a course about dinosaurs, go for it you know so the it's, it's it's been that sort of that and and i i don't know i never really thought that i was the the, the smartest person but i always th thought that people have a knack for something everyone has a knack and my knack was just ha being guided and meeting and associating with the most amazing people the my mentors at, at at you know in grad school and at the museum and and the people that i that i met when i was writing you know, who gets Elaine Markson as their first literary agent? She was a goddess of, of uh, you know, agent in New York City. And, you know, here this wonderful woman takes me on as a client. How does that happen? You I know? don't know. It's, it's the same with this show. Who? Why does Isabel Allende or David Mitchell or Paul Harding, why do they want to talk to me? You know, <laughs> it, you know, it's like, 
how lucky can I be? Yeah, we are lucky. Yeah, it's it's great. Well, actually, on that note, that's a great place to end this conversation. And hopefully, when teeth are done, <laughs> when teeth is done, we can talk again. I would love to. Yeah, that that's that. I, I'd love to to do that. This has been uh, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, definitely a bunch of um, questions that I hadn't run into yet, which I think you probably spent time trying to think up. Yeah, I'm like I'm like you. You know, I. I want to like throw you off. I don't want it's not it's not being interviewed by Terry Gross. I'm like Fugu. Wait a minute. Oh, it's the puffer fest show. Wait a minute. <laughs> don't screw this up. Bill. <laughs> okay. Cool. We'll talk soon. Okay. Take care. Thank you. you too, Bill. Thank you.